Honorable Minister, um, Ambassador Jaitutan, thank you, and the HEB board, thank you very much for this invitation. And I thank uh, Muhammad Alami Musa, Ambassador Musa, very much for your kind introduction to me. I must start by saying how happy I am here. My wife will share these sentiments. To be able to uh, participate in the new program that RSIS is mounting and to experience the wonderful and gracious and warm hospitality of Singapore. I feel almost Singaporean, and uh, I'm mentioning this to, in the presence of the minister so that he can appreciate how much we are enjoying this experience. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And uh, uh, let me start my lecture without ado. Now, I am to uh, lecture today on uh, Hinduism, um, peace building, and the religious other. So in a way, that lecture divides itself into three parts. And I want to start off by saying something about what Hinduism is. Now, this is a very difficult subject, as you probably realize, to deal with, because the scholars and the thinkers about Hinduism have many different answers to this one question. Who is a Hindu and what is Hinduism? In fact, you can, um, in university, uh, spend much of your career discussing only this one issue. But it is very important to be able to use the word Hindu because it, is, it gives identity to people. There have been some suggestions that this word, this expression should not be used because it is so vague an expression. And that is not the case. Um, a Hindu is someone who describes himself as a Hindu, and a Hindu is someone who is given a certain identity and describes himself or herself with that identity, and if there is not such an expression that we can use, well, my book on Hinduism would not sell. And many people would be disempowered and disenfranchised. The allocation of resources, the allocation of different facilities and so on among the world religions uh, would, find, would be very difficult to do if you could not actually identify uh, Hinduism as a specific tradition. But one of the things I will try and explain today is how interestingly different Hinduism is from other religious traditions in the world, and it is creatively different from other traditions in the world. So one of the tasks that I will try and uh, explain today is the models that we have to think in terms of in order to understand how Hindus shape the world, how Hindus engage with the world according to the traditional understandings of Hinduism. Now, as you know, Hinduism is the majority religion of uh, the political entity that is India. About 80% of the population of India, about 850 to 900 million people, are designated as Hindus by government census. That is a very large number of people. So as the majority religion of India, it is a majority religion of a country that in the next couple of generations will be a global superpower. 
which is on its way to being a global superpower already. So we are discussing a religious tradition that will have its impact, not only nationally, but also globally. And I would suggest that it is very important to seek an understanding of how Hindus relate to the world, at least traditionally. I know that there are many individual exceptions, but I hope that many things that I will say today will resonate with Hindus and will be interesting to Hindus and non-Hindus alike. Not only in India, but Hinduism has an appreciable uh, presence in many countries around the world. I think Singapore itself has somewhere like 300,000 Hindus. The United Kingdom has anywhere from 600,000 to 800,000 Hindus, and so on and so forth. So there is a diaspora, there is a scattering of Hindus around the world, which continues to make this an important tradition to come to terms with. Hinduism is therefore a world religion because of three criteria. The spread around the world and the numbers, that's one. The geographical spread also around the world, number two. And the cultural influence in the world. So when we talk of world religions, I would say at least two of these criteria: numbers, geographical spread, and influence, cultural influence, should be met. Hinduism meets all three. And so it's a world religion in the strongest sense of the term. The word Hindu, as many of you know, came from the Sanskrit word Sindhu, which was the name of that river that is today in the political uh, state that is Pakistan, the Indus River. The word Indus comes from Sindhu, which is a Sanskrit word for that river which the Aryans or Aryas, we are familiar with the word Aryan. Aryan is a Sanskrit word meaning the noble, hospitable one. The Aryas named that river, the Sindhu, and gave it mystical and sacred properties. And in about 500 BCE, before the Common Era, before the Christian Era, when the Persian Emperor Darius I was on the throne, and conquered those territories in northwest of the subcontinent, Old Persian dropped the S and Sindhu became Hindu. So Hinduism began mainly as a name for those people and their cultures and their habits and their ways that lived beyond the Indus in the subcontinent. So it started life as a cultural term, not particularly as a religious term. And that is a very important point to grasp, that to say someone is a Hindu is to make a cultural point, is to make a point as well as a religious point that they have a certain way of coping with reality. So we bypass to begin with, all those issues about doctrine and belief that other religious traditions are so concerned with in describing what their religious followers are. You see, the model is are beginning to change already. If you say, who is a Christian? Well, a Christian is someone who belongs to the religion that has been founded by Jesus Christ um, and that they believe certain things. Who is a Muslim? A Muslim is someone who follows the religion that has been propounded by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who also have certain doctrinal beliefs, even though they may differ from some Muslim to the other, and so on. But you see, who is a Hindu? And I will try and explain, there is no one founder of Hinduism. 
It's a different model. There is no one system of belief. It's not a creedal system. So our notions of religion have been formed by Western society based on the Protestant understanding of what religion is and the Protestant model of what religion is. But the concept of religion is much bigger than that. And we have to fit in other world religious traditions other than the Abrahamic traditions under this concept of religion. So I'm going to try and stretch the concept in such a way that will show you that Hindus have a unique way of coping with the world, negotiating with the world, engaging with the world, making sense of the world, which is creatively different and that we may learn from. Now Hinduism, like other religions, is tremendously diverse. The first thing I've done is to say that you cannot look at a system of belief and say all Hindus must believe that. You can't say that. It's a different model operating. The second thing I want to say is that you cannot ask what is the Hindu view of suffering as if there is only one answer. You cannot even ask this about Christianity and Islam. But people say, okay, what is the Hindu view of suffering? What is the Hindu view on homosexuality? What is the Hindu view on life after death? There is no one Hindu view because there are a number and each of them is valid in its own way. So we have to stretch the concept of religion through understanding how Hindus operate. And I'll say much more about this now. Similarly, you cannot ask, what do Hindus believe about God? As if there is one answer. Some Hindus believe from their one tradition these things about God. Some Hindus believe another thing about God. Some Hindus have a different description of God from others. So we must do away with these simplistic, simplistic questions and expect simplistic answers. And Hinduism is that religious tradition that helps us to stretch our imaginations and broaden our understanding. But there is something, as I will show you, I hope, that defines what it is to be a Hindu. Not a system of belief, but an attitude to the world, an approach to the world that is extremely different and creative. And that's going to be the burden of this essay, or at least this part, rather of this, this talk before I move on to peace building. Because I cannot give you an answer and say Hinduism is one way of peace building, one solution. They have a number of creative ways, precisely because of the nature of this reality that we call Hinduism. Secondly, I'm never happy as a scholar, and you will all, many of you will agree with this when you have thought about it, with this abstract ending of a term, Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism. In older days, before I was born, I'm not that old, in older days, they used to say Mohammedanism. Now they don't use this expression because it offends Muslims, uh, because people were making the mistake of saying, well, Christians uh, worship Christ, but Muslims do not worship. Muhammad, peace be upon him, because he is a human being, a very extraordinary human being, but not divine. So now we have changed, we speak of Islam. But it used to be, again, the abstract ending, Muhammadanism, Christianity, Hinduism. I don't like these abstract endings for this reason, because it gives the impression that there's a standard way of belief. All Hindus who belong to Hinduism will have one answer to one question. And that is not the case, as I've just been saying. Similarly, you say Christianity, all the Christians must have one answer to one question. Secondly, the term Hinduism, Christianity, Sikhism, Buddhism, to use that ism, ism, ism at the end is a divisive way of speaking because it separates you from me. Oh, 
I belong to Hinduism, you belong, sir, to Sikhism, therefore we are, we are different. We, we, it is divisive. There's much that we may share in common as human beings and as believers. But we are forced to use these expressions in schools and in universities. But if we use them, let us use them in an informed way, realizing the damage they can do if you're not using them in an informed way. They can be divisive terms, them and us. And the whole goal of peace building is to bridge divides. So yes, use the word Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, and so on, but remember that they are not meant to be divisive uses of the term. Secondly, if we use the word ism at the end, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on, we get the impression that they are all standardized, that there is no diversity of belief. And that's again not true. There's no first class Hindus and second class Hindus, first class Christians and second class Christians, first class Muslims and second class Muslims. So it glosses over internal divisions, which are very important in our lives. The reality of our lives is that we have a diversity of belief. So I'm making now some methodological points just to clean up, to clear up how I'm going to use this expression Hinduism. All religious traditions have internal diversity. Hinduism has more diversity than most. And I'll give you a small example to show you that all religious traditions have internal diversity. This joke was told to me by my Jewish friends. There was a Jewish castaway on a desert island. And he was there for 30 years all on his own. And every day he used to build a bonfire in the hope that some ship would see the smoke rising from the bonfire on this distant desert island and come and rescue him. One day a ship came and saw the bonfire. And the captain of the ship put out the boat and the boat came to the desert island and saw the castaway who was standing on the beach waiting for them. So the captain said, well, we have come to save you. <clears throat> How many people are on this island? He said, only me, only one. So the captain said, all right, let's go. Is there anything that you want to take with you? Any small possessions you may have? He said, yes, come to my hut. It's a very small desert island in the middle. I'll take a few of my possessions and I'll come with you. So the captain and his first officer went with this man to the hut and saw a small synagogue next to the hut. And 100 yards away was another synagogue. The captain said, I thought you were the only person in this island. He said, yes. This is the synagogue in which I worship, and that's the one in which I do not worship. <laughs> so he had to create another synagogue. We are all internally diverse. And any religious tradition can crack the same joke. Jews, Muslims, Christians, and so on. We are internally diverse as religious tradition, and we must respect this diversity. We must celebrate this diversity. And Hinduism is, as I say, again and again, more diverse than others. Now, I come more to the heart of my question. All of you are familiar with the banyan tree. Do you have banyan trees in Singapore? Yes. If you go to Calcutta, or Kolkata, as they call it now, in, uh, in West Bengal, in India, and go to the botanical gardens, there is an immense banyan tree in the Calcutta Botanical Gardens. You know what a banyan tree does. It puts out branches in the normal way. Then aerial roots fall from the branches into the ground and take root there and become thicker and thicker. And then it puts out more branches and more roots so that a very old banyan tree I don't know how old the oldest banyan tree is in Singapore, but this banyan tree in the botanical gardens of Calcutta is at least 300 years old. It has a canopy of four acres. It's over half a mile, three quarters of a mile to walk around that one tree. 
and it has a thousand different trunks. You do not know where the tree starts and where it ends. If you look at a coconut tree, it has one trunk, branches, you know exactly where the tree starts, where the tree ends. It is monocentric. It has one center, one big trunk. But if you look at the banyan tree, an old banyan tree, it can have 1,000 different apparent trunks. So you do not know where the tree begins or has begun where it ends. A good model of Hinduism is not the coconut tree, but is the banyan tree. Hinduism has so many different trunks, has so many different ways of understanding the reality of God and so on, that it's more like this multi-trunked banyan tree. But there's one thing in common, and I call that polycentrism. And I will, can give it to you by an example. And this is where I hope that what I say will resonate with other Hindus. This is where Hinduism is different from Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and so on. Let me give you some examples so that you understand. You are all familiar that Hindus, you see Hindu temples, there's one close by. Hindus are supposed to have many gods. A lot of murtis, a lot of images of different deities. Vishnu, Shiva, the goddess, Ganesha. Vishnu himself has different forms. Shiva has different forms. The goddess has numerous forms. And so on and so forth. Dozens and dozens and dozens. Does that mean that Hindus believe in many gods? Yes and no. If you look at the Shastras, if you look at the texts of Hinduism, what individual Hindus, Hindus say or believe is not my responsibility, but I can tell you what the theological texts teach. The ideal situation. If you look at the different Shastras, they say there is one, one supreme principle. You can, call it, you can call it Ishvara, you can call it Brahman, you can give it different names. There's one supreme principle which manifests in different forms. So if you personally follow Vishnu, then Vishnu is for you the definitive or the fulfilling manifestation. Rama, Krishna, and so on and so forth are manifestations in turn of Vishnu. Or if you follow, follow Shiva, then there are different manifestations of Shiva. If you follow the goddess, there are different manifestations. But it all goes back to one principle. So this is also monotheistic, but it is also polycentric. It is also pluralistic. It is polymorphic monotheism. Monotheism manifesting in different morphes or forms. Now, it is not the same in Islam. It is not the same in Christianity. It is not the same in Judaism. God does not manifest in different forms in these other religions, but in Hinduism, God manifests, or that one principle, that transcendent supreme principle manifests in different forms. It's a different way of looking at the world. That one supreme reality has lots of different manifestations. Another example is not confined only. So is this polytheism? No, these different manifestations are different manifestations of the same supreme principle. But you will find this in Hinduism you will not find this in the Abrahamic faiths. Another example, scripture. How many Qurans are there? One Quran. How many Bibles are there? One Bible. The Hindu scripture is called the Veda. And there are four Vedas which form the Veda. <coughs> but there are lots of other texts which say that they are the fifth Veda. They say to study the Veda is very difficult. It is written in old Sanskrit. It's hard to understand. The priests don't explain it very clearly. But there are more popular texts like the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, which are full of stories of activities of different individuals, personalities. And the Hindu tradition says this is the fifth Veda. This we can understand. 
The teaching that you find in the original Veda is also found in this text, Panchama Veda, the fifth Veda. Polycentrism. There is not just one center like the coconut tree. There are many different trunks saying the same kind of thing, each one a different form of the original. And you find this way of approaching the world only among Hindus. Another example. So, scripture is polycentric, worship is polycentric, space and time is polycentric. I visited Mauritius on four occasions, sent by the University of Cambridge to help them Mauritianize their exams. And there is a sub substantial Hindu community in Mauritius. Now, Mauritius, as you know, was first ruled by the French, who were kicked out by the British, who were kicked out by the Mauritians. And now they're ruling themselves. So some of the places in Mauritius have French names. But the Hindu community, when they knew I came there, said, come, we will show you around. And in the middle of that small island, not much different from um, Sri Lanka, about 38 miles by 28 miles, <coughs> in the middle of that small island, there is a lake. And the Hindus call it Ganga Talab, Ganges Lake. So I said, why do you call it this? They said, because the first Mauritians, Indians who came here, about 60% of the populations are of Indian ancestry. They came as indentured laborers. They couldn't go back to their mother country. So what happened was some Hindus managed to go back and they brought some Ganges water and poured it into this lake. This has become another manifestation of the Ganges. You don't have to go so many thousand miles away to get the sacred properties of the Ganges. The Ganges is now with us. Polycentrism. There is more than one manifestation of the Ganges. In the Middle Ages, in the Rashtrakuta kingdom, the king who was ruling the middle of the country it had some mountains, it had some rivers. He renamed those rivers Ganga and the mountains Kailasha. And said, now you see, the ancient mountain of Kailasha where Shiva dwells and the sacred river of Ganga have now manifested themselves in my kingdom. Therefore, I am legitimated by God to rule the kingdom. Now, this is an acceptable procedure in Hindu tradition. The multiplicity of one transcendent principle appearing in different forms, in different manifestations. It's a different way of shaping the world, ordering the world. It's a strategy for propagation and survival. Ancient China has come and gone. Ancient Babylon has come and gone. Ancient Mesopotamia have come and gone. But this tradition continues for 5,000, 6,000 years repropagating itself and surviving in terms of this polycentric strategy. And my final example, to show you that it applies across the board, and in no other tradition does this. We are all familiar with the river called the Ganges. On that river, there's a famous city, which in English, in its anglified form, is Benares. But the Sanskrit word, the ancient word for that city is Kashi. Now, if a Muslim wants to do the Hajj, he has to go to Makkah. If a Christian wants to go to the center, a Catholic wants to go to the center of the Christian, he has to go to Rome. If a Jew wants to pray in the most sacred place, he or she has to go to the Wailing Wall of Jerusalem. Geographically, one place. But India is a vast country. And Kashi or Benares is one city on the Ganges. You have to go thousands of miles there because it's a very sacred city. So what have the Hindus done? They have named a place on the river in the north called Uttar Kashi, Northern Kashi. And in the south, Dakshina Kashi, Southern Kashi. And an interconnected grid has been set up. So there's not one Kashi, there are three Kashis. You don't have to go all the way to the 
Kashi on the Ganges, you can go to the northern Kashi which is closer by and the southern Kashi which is closer and get the same sacred properties from the river there because the one transcendent principle sanctifying Kashi manifests in the northern Kashi and the southern Kashi. But you can't do that if you want to do the Hajj. You can't do that if you want to go to the Wailing Wall. There's only one place you can go to. Here you can go to three, four, five if necessary. It's a different way of looking at the world, which is called, what I call this polycentrism. And this is a way of managing the world in such a way that it enables you to survive in different contexts by setting up this interactive grid between the different manifestations of one transcendent principle. That lies at the heart of Hinduism. So, as a Hindu, you can believe in Shiva, or you can believe in Vishnu, or you can believe in Devi or the goddess, but your way of approaching the world and structuring the world is polycentric. And one of the things happening in modern India, this is traditional, one of the things happening in modern India is a move away from this because this, this approach, this polycentric approach, creates public spaces where toleration, conceptual toleration can take place. Okay, you see, you see it in this way, and I will see it in that way. There are different forms. It is a perspectival approach, etc., etc. We won't necessarily attack one another. But now in some modern forms of Hinduism, and I just say this as a fact, I don't say this as an evaluation, you can discuss it in question and answer. In some modern forms of Hinduism, they want to abolish this polycentric approach and have a monocentric or unicentric approach. There's only one text that is important, the Veda, that particular Veda. There is only one approach to a certain problem, usually my approach. There is only one way of doing this or doing that. It is, it, is, it is becoming a monocentric approach, which is in a fact way aping, copying the Western uh, models of religion and departing from the traditional, more tolerant, perspectival, polycentric approach of Hinduism. Now, was this for the good or for the bad is a separate issue because I must hurry on now to the next part of my lecture. But I hope I've given you some indication of how Hinduism has a, is a different way of approaching the world. It doesn't depend on doctrinal diversity. It doesn't depend on practices. Some eat beef, some don't eat beef. It depends on reordering, restructuring the world polycentrically, saying there are alternative forms alternative ways of the original, which is hard to grasp. And we can grasp things from our own particular situation in life. And that can be as valid as someone else's grasp of things. Consider that, that's, that's a very significant approach in this world. Now I come to peace building, but you can only understand peace building in Hinduism if you understand this polycentric approach. And that's why I've spent some time on this. Now, I take you to a very important text in Hinduism, which was uh, by scholars say, this is a scholarly judgment, it was uh, composed at about um, the first two or three centuries CE, common era, AD, if you want to use that expression, the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is um, a small text in, written in Sanskrit of 700 verses, traditionally. There are some different versions where a few more verses may be added or subtracted, but generally 700 verses in 18 chapters. And it purports to be, it, that's how it appears, a conversation between the descent of Lord Vishnu, Krishna, and his disciple Arjuna. It is a war text. They're talking about peace. But somebody said, right, if you want peace, prepare for war. So it's a war text. Two great armies are facing each other on the battlefield, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Krishna is on the side of the Pandavas. 
And just before the battle is about to begin, Arjuna, the great warrior of the Pandavas, looks at the opponents, at the enemy, and says, how can I fight them? Mathula, there are my maternal uncles, there are my relatives, there is Drona, the guru who taught me to uh, be a great archer and so on. I'm fighting family. I can't fight them. No, Yutsyaiti, I will not fight. And in dejection, he let his bow called Gandiva slip from his hand and he sat on the chariot where Krishna was acting as his charioteer and said, No, Yutsyaiti, I will not fight. And then this is the pretext for Krishna to launch into the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, to tell him, you must fight. There is a great tradition of warfare in Hinduism, which you must understand. The Kshatriya, the Kshatriya Varna, were great warriors. And in fact, if you look at the Mahabharata, which is this great text, you find many passages saying, it is the duty of a warrior to fight and attain heaven. So don't think that Hindu tradition has been entirely peaceable in, in the way that Gandhi uh, approached it. You must understand all these things before you understand what Hinduism can offer for peace building. It is from a position of strength, not from a position of weakness. Because there is an established tradition of warfare and a code of chivalry and so on in Hinduism. And I brought uh, my copy of the Bhagavad Gita here. And the, the Gita says, uh, here is one example. I'll say it in the Sanskrit and then give the translation. Swargam param adhipsi satha suyuddhina kurudvadva. In other words, the Kurus, the Kauravas, the descendants of the Kurus are saying, we are desirous of heaven by fighting a good war. You fight a good war, and this is what the Kshatriya will do, the warrior, he will go to heaven. Come on, let us fight. So Hinduism has a strong tradition of warfare, established warfare, and it is from a position of strength then, not weakness, that you can build an understanding of peace building in Hinduism. And Krishna teaches Arjuna, he says, you must fight not for so this is a concept, very early concept of a just war. But once you have a concept of a just war, you can have concept of peace, right? And Krishna says, you don't fight because you want a kingdom. You don't fight because you want to hammer your enemies. You don't fight because you want loot and wealth. He says, karmani eva dhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana. You have to fight because it is your duty, not because of the fruits of your battle. Mahapaleshu, not for the fruits of the battle, because it's your duty. This is what dharma is all about, your righteousness. Sometimes you have to fight. And you fight out of dutifulness, not for personal gain must banish all desire for personal gain. And then he goes on to teach in chapter 9. And what is your duty? Many people stop there. Those who don't perhaps believe in God or in a higher reality. Okay, that will also do up to a point. Duty is a purifying thing. But he goes to teach in chapter 9 and chapter 12. Fight because it's your duty to serve me the supreme being. I am the one who oversees the whole world. I act without any personal gain. Therefore, dutifully, you, co you copy me. You follow my example. You imitate me. You do it out of love and devotion for me, selflessly. And so the just war in, in traditional Hinduism is a war where the individual fights out of duty and not for any kind of personal gain. Right, we've reached this far. Now where does peace come into the picture? 
And peace comes into the picture in this context, this polycentric context of Hinduism, and in this context of the just war. So, how much time do I have? Finished, no chance, no chance. Ambassador, Ambassador Musa knows when I gave a lecture in his institute that he was going to have this conflict with me about time. So he's given me 10 minutes more. 10 minutes is exactly what I need. Peace building and the religious other. In the 19th century, it was a very crucial time for Indian polity. Because in the 19th century, Hinduism reinvented itself and modernized. Traditional Hinduism kept the polycentric approach, but it also came into engagement with Western modernity through the colonial powers, the British, who were ruling the country. They had to come to terms with them. The British brought in all their Western ways of doing things and um, Western ideas and concepts about reason about scripture about christianity and hindus the intellectuals the intelligentsia had to confront this and meet it now i've done research on this and you will see throughout the 19th century one paradigm one model operating among hindu leaders implicitly political and explicitly political I call it the altruistic paradigm. Altruism means you do something not for others, not for personal gain. That is altruism. I do something for others and not for personal gain. And this is the altruistic paradigm. Now let me explain it to you. All the religious leaders, the political leaders, Devendra Natrago, Swami Dayananda, Vivekananda, and last but not least, Mahatma Gandhi, who came into the 20th century. All of them operated and implemented this paradigm in interestingly different ways. And it is this. There is, and it is a spiritual paradigm, because they were all spiritual people. They said there is a transcendent principle, a transcendent reality. You can call it God, you can call it Brahman, you can call it Ishwara, you can, well, it's a transcendent reality. And the individual self, the Atman, the Jiva Atman, the living self, of each individual is intimately related to that transcendent self. Some believe that it was another form of it, Advaita. They were not two, they were one. Some believe that the transcendent self could be called God, that it was different from us, but the in relationship was very, very close, intimate, existential. It's a very profound relationship. And they said, all of them in different ways, that life consists in evacuating, emptying the small, the selfish Atman, self, so that it can be properly aligned, properly connected to the Supreme Self, the Paramatman or Brahman. And the whole process of life is a discipline, a discipline in evacuating the empirical, the selfish ego, so that the Paramatman which dwells within can manifest itself. Now, this was said also by the great theologian Shankara, Ramanuja, and so on in the 9th and the 12th century. What was different in the 19th century? This is what was different because they said, and the way you can show this, the way you can discipline yourself to do this is by identifying or loving the other. That is a sign that you have been altruistic, that you've emptied yourself. There was a social dimension, social gospel if you want, to this way of thinking, this discipline. Let me give you some examples because to show you this is not airy-fairy talk, I'm using the text, the words of these individuals themselves 
to say this. So let me give you an example of what they said and how they said it. This is how Gandhi explained his nonviolent movement, Ahimsa and Satyagraha. Agraha, grasp. Satya, truth. Satyagraha is grasping truth, but allowing truth to grasp you also. And this is what he said. And I'm quoting Gandhi. To suffer is to fraternize. So suffering can be converted into a way of showing that the other whom you are suffering in sympathy with is your brother or sister. It's not just suffering in itself for no purpose at all, or feeling pain and being uh, collapsed in the old ego. By sh fasting, that's why he made these fasts. I share the other's identity. I fraternize with the other. I show my solidarity with the other. True, he says, the ego serves, uh, ceases to serve as a foothold. The ego goes away. But the loss is a release at the same time. The sufferer feels anchored and enriched in his realized identity with the other. So far as we are really identical in being, when anyone is purified through prayerful suffering, the good in others tends to be released. So if I show my solidarity with you and suffer in solidarity with you by fasting or whatever, I diminish my ego, but I release the goodness in you. There is a connection. I'm not just fasting out of symbol symbolically. I'm fasting to express my solidarity, my fraternity with the other. This seems to me deep structure thinking deep structure thinking because peace is based on an appreciation and recognition that we're all members of the same human family. And you can't go deeper than that. Let me give you another example. I've got so many examples. I can talk for three hours, but uh, he won't let me talk for three hours. I've only got about five minutes left. I've only got about five minutes left. You heard of Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, who was a Bengali. I grew up in Bengal. My wife is Bengali. Bengal is the center of the world. But anyway, I pass on quickly. <laughs> I pass on quickly. Bankim Chatterjee was a Bengali. He was a great intellectual, and he, um, he wrote uh, very strongly on social and religious themes and so on, helped create a new consciousness in Bengal, and through Bengal, it spread to other parts of India. This is part of the altruistic paradigm of the 19th century. That's why the 19th century is so important in India. Because these leaders were projecting an image of the human race whereby solidarity was the key to self-expression and to peace, resolution of conflict. And, and Bankim Chatterjee was not an Advaitin. He believed that there was an infinite being called God, a personal being. But this is how he writes. This is how a Hindu writes. The Hindu God, he says, I quote him again, pervades everything. Sarva Bhutatmai. It is he who is the inner self, Antaratma, of all things. He is not the material world, being different from it, but the world exists in him alone. Look at the intimacy of that relationship. He is present in everyone. He is present in me. In loving myself, I love him. And in not loving him, I fail to love myself. And in loving him, I love every human being. Again, the identification with others. So long as I do not grasp the fact that the whole world is myself, that the universe is not different from me, I have not acquired knowledge, I have not acquired dharma, I have not acquired devotion or bhakti or love, priti. Therefore, love for the world lies at the very root of Hindu dharma or righteousness. And there can be no Hinduness 
without this indivisible, non-separate, universal love. And I can give you similar quotations from Swami Vivekananda, who was another very important leader in the proto-nationalist movement, so it has strong political repercussions, with the same social dimension in his thinking. So it's not one, it's not two. Starting from the Bindanath to Gaur in the beginning of the 19th century and ending with Gandhi in the 1940s, the 20th century, you had the same palette paradigm in different modes and forms projecting itself among political and social and religious leaders. Not all Bengali, some Gujarati, some North Indian, Punjabi, and so on and so forth. They shared this paradigm, but expressed it differently. Another example of polycentrism. Now, this solidarity, sense of solidarity with other human beings, irrespective of caste, irrespective of gender, irrespective of race, irrespective of background, that we're all part of one human family because the supreme reality indwells all of us. This approach is the deep structure foundation for peaceability and peace in Hinduism. In, you see, there are different ways of doing it. You don't have to believe a certain dogma or creed, but you have to approach the world in a certain way. I realize that I'm uh, uh, encroaching on the, my time, but I hope I've given you some indication of what Hinduism is what its unique approach in shaping the world is, the polycentric approach, which operates in terms of scripture, which operates in terms of space and time, which operates in terms of polymorphic monotheism, the different manifestations of the deity, which operates in terms of this altruistic paradigm, which is the foundation for building peace. Once you have this conviction, you may not have it. I'm not talking about individual conviction. I'm talking about what Hindus have projected Leading Hindus, significant Hindus have projected in the 19th century, which shaped the political, which shaped the political movement of the nationalist movement. I'm talking about that. So that is the foundation, and it's a very deep structure foundation on the basis of which conflict resolution and peace can take place. So um, the religious other, in other words, becomes an extension of the human family, an integral part of the human family, and another manifestation of myself. How can I kill such a person? How can I harm or injure such a person? Even though we may believe in different things. I'll stop here, thank you very much. So, could I invite uh, the first question, please? Yes, the gentleman here. How do we handle the mic? Yes. Is there? Or, oh, I'm sorry, you have to find, you find your way to the mic, microphone on the side, if you don't mind. I think it's a bit far. Could we hand him? Yeah, that's easier. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, could you also identify yourself? Yes. Thank you. I'm a Yap Kim Hao, a council member of the Interreligious Organization Singapore. Um, Professor Lipner, thank you very much for your very illuminating talk and for enlightening me on the distinctive aspects of Hinduism, even though I belong to the Christian community. I Google you <laughs> as I try to prepare myself to listen to your lecture. And I realize you are a great, uh, you regard John Hicks as your mentor. I do not have the privilege to uh, have men, uh, John Hicks as my mentor. But I do appreciate the influence that John Hicks and his writings which you uh, seem to appreciate and put me into a very interreligious mode in my life. One of the expressions that I've uh, come across is that uh, it holds true in every religion. 
Religion has always been associated, as you have indicated, with the idea that we must know our religious beliefs, our religious systems, although you regard it as a Western-based, and also to be pious or acts of devotion. But unfortunately, much of us have been experiencing the phenomenon in which we disregard the kind of actions, except actions really relating religion. So my question to you is, this whole three principles of action, knowledge, religious knowledge, and piety or devotion, we'll never have enough, we never know enough, we'll never be religious enough, and we'll never act enough. It seems to me that there must be an interplay between the three forces, and we always have to act on that. So please comment about this interplay between actions so that they are, in, uh, they are understood by how we are to approach our religion. Okay. And related to that will be the whole idea that in the fundamentalist could, expressions... Sorry, in, could I interrupt? I, mean, I just need uh, to get others the opportunity to ask a question. Yes. Can you come to the point, please? The, the, the point is that the interplay between okay. action... Yeah. Uh, knowledge and devotion and the, and the whole idea of, in some sense, uh, what the, how to deal with the fundamental, fundamentalism which emphasizes so much of dogma and the one way in, instead of the polycentric way. Thank you very much. Uh, this works. You can hear me? Yeah. Knowledge, action, piety these three dimensions of human living. <clears throat> and you said we can never have enough knowledge. We can never do enough. Sometimes it's important not to do certain things rather than to do certain things. And piety, I would say virtue or uprightness, which takes in even people who do not believe necessarily in a supreme power. That too, I think, is viable. And the question is, you may never have enough, but all these three are very important, you are right. And as they say, it is better to light a candle than curse the darkness. So we have to do the best we can in the circumstances we find ourselves in order to blend knowledge, piety, or virtue, and action. So I agree, you have this tri-dimensional way of proceeding. But if we do it in the right way, we set other people on fire. We generate a modality where they wish to participate in what we are doing. And I think an individual action then becomes social, even though it's in a smaller circle, and that's very important. So that's how I would answer what you say. Thank you. Uh, there's somebody behind you want to, yes? My name is Vijayan. I am in the uh, financial services consultant in an insurance industry. Uh, my question is, uh, you said that there are so many isms, like Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and things like that. And these are all uh, different uh, types of religions. But in Hinduism itself, uh, can you say it is a way of life? Because since the time we get up from bed in the morning till we retire uh, to bed in the night, there is a certain way of life that a Hindu should lead. Can you say it's a, it's a way of life rather than a religion? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm quite happy with that way of speaking. I mean, all religious traditions say that religion should not be compartmentalized from life. I fully appreciate that. And uh, yet, many religious traditions implement certain creeds or belief systems as an important input into shaping their way of life. And what I'm trying to say in Hinduism is that you may have your own belief systems, and there are different kinds of belief systems, but what is important is this approach to the world, whereby you shape the world, order the world, dispose the world 
in this polycentric way. You realize that there are alternative perspectives inherent in your way of life. That the, your perspective, whether it's religious or whatever, is not the only perspective that is viable or that is right, in inverted commas, and that you're prepared to tolerate. Does that mean that you accept every perspective? No. Cruelty, murder, you must reject. But short of those things, other religious approaches and so on, must be given the respect in that space that you have created in your way of thinking, the polycentric approach, that shows respect for them, as I say, and that allows you to accept as viable other established perspectives. So a religious tradition that can produce someone like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or a religious tradition that can produce someone like Jesus Christ and so on, and which has nourished and nurtured millions of people around the world, must be given the respect and viability through the polycentric approach that your own, that religious tradition that has produced Gandhi and other people like that. That's the kind of point. It's, there is a connection between that way of thinking and the Hindu approach to life that is quite intimate and quite interesting. That's the point I'm making. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor, I'll just come direct to my question. You mentioned in your lecture about Hinduism and established traditions of war, warfare. And you did explain that warfare in Hinduism is not for personal gain or looting or glory, but rather for as uh, a duty. Now, what I would like your views, Professor, is in what way is this comparable to jihad in Islam? My understanding of jihad is, uh, of course, Muslims know it is an internal striving uh, against our daily challenges and always try to be the best that we can. In fact, that is the bigger jihad if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's the greater jihad than the smaller jihad. Now, uh, in terms of a, a war, there is two kinds. One is uh, aggressive, you know, for the sake of expansion and all that. The other is defensive. So I think for Muslims, it is more defensive, a defensive war, or a war for justice. So I would like your learned opinion, Professor. Is there a concept of uh, internal struggle in Hinduism also as it is in Islam, like uh, jihad? And uh, what uh, is, is there is aggressive war, you know, for purposes of expansion also accepted uh, in Hinduism or it is uh, rejected? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am, uh, I am, uh, oh, I just was, I've retired as professor of Hinduism in the comparative study. Unfortunately, I'm not professor of Hinduism and Islam in the comparative study of religion. So uh, my Muslim colleagues and experts will, uh, I stand subject to correction to what, what they would say. But I understand that jihad, in many cases, not all, has been misunderstood and misconstrued. Jihad is really a spiritual warfare, the greater jihad, in doing the best you can in following the dictates of the Supreme Being. And you submit all your passions, everything. Islam is about submission to the will of God. And that is one of its unique uh, characteristics. Now, um, jihad actually expressed in physical warfare can only serve the purpose of the greater jihad, the purification and the submission to the will of God. And so many people can mix these things up. And we know that there are some cases of Muslims who take it upon themselves to be spokespeople of God when they wage physical war. Uh, and I think uh, they get it wrong. In Hinduism, 
there is place for warfare, but not for personal gain, therefore for territorial expansion, for booty, for power hungry, land grabbing or whatever, is not condoned by the traditional texts. The fact that there were Hindu kings who did it uh, is a separate issue. They did not follow the ideal. But war is, and this is the great contribution of Gandhi. He took this, this understanding of war being engaged in as a duty when necessary. So he says, I cannot justify cowardice. But on the other hand, war is a last resort, not a ready resort. It is a desperate resort of defense, but not a ready resort. And that's a very important distinction. Too many people regard war as something you, you do immediately. But for Gandhi, it was a very last resort to be avoided at all costs unless it was absolutely necessary. So, um, Ahimsa, nonviolence, is not another word for cowardice or passivity because you are constantly struggling with yourself in a discipline to control your passions, to control your baser urges. So similarly to what you are saying, it is a discipline, a sadhana. And I agree with you from that point of view. P Professor, uh, to, to use, my, to use a, a, my privilege of my seat, can I just ask you, who would you think, who would be the appropriate person to maybe judge whether a war is righteous or not? Well, <laughs> well uh, I defer to the chairman and uh, I must uh, answer him. Um, the proper person to judge, I take you back to the Manusmriti. Which is, a, which is a very important uh, code, a book of uh, behavior, uh, Dharma Shastra, going back to the beginning of the common era. And they started a tradition there which continues in India to today and which other people can also learn. Manu makes it very clear. He said, whenever any important judgment has to be made, you need a group of people who are expert in certain skills to formulate that judgment, not one person. And the king must set up, therefore, a council, and he lists about nine or ten people who should be represented there. Um, people, who are, people who are expert in warfare, people who are expert in dharma, people who are expert in logic, yukti, people who are expert in understanding politics, these must form a council and they come to a consensus. So we think that the West introduced the committee, but Manu, I think, introduced the committee. But the idea was that one person, one person cannot make a unilateral judgment without proper advice and counsel. And you will find this continuing in India. Many violated it, of course. That happens in human living. But you find this continuing in India right to present times. You have the panchayat in the village, you have uh, cabinet ministers, and you have councils and so on. Um, I'm not saying they are following Manu, I'm just saying that this idea uh, is, is already in Manu. So that's how you judge. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Jamshed Fosdar. I belong to the Baha'i faith. <coughs> Uh, professor, being exactly 20 years older than you, I'm going to be both foolish and brave. And if you'll forgive my irreverence, uh, I, I was very pleased to hear what you said. But uh, some of the aspects remind me, I think you also know that Sanskrit truism, that what we do not understand, we explain to each other. Uh, my point is uh, Krishna, for example, you will find uh, that in the Rig Veda 7, uh, he's already mentioned there. So Krishna is very ancient. And it's that fellow, the Fajr, Vyasa, who took the Mahabharata and put in the Bhagavad Gita as a recompense for the two warring sides. 
So my point is, uh, chronologically, uh, in your talk, you should have brought that out to show that Krishna was not an Aryan. He was a Dravidian, if anything at all, because he was much older than the oldest Rig Veda, otherwise he would not have been mentioned in there. Now, <clears throat> there is a very nice article by Vajumdar called Hindutva. It's 1991. And there he points out about the migration of the Aryans and how they eliminated all kinds of resistance among the Dravidians, and etc. So I think it's important when you're giving a talk on Hinduism, you should bring that out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Any other question? Next question, please. Let me just give a very quick answer sure. to that. Okay. Because I don't agree with some of it. Krishna is mentioned in the Vedas, yes. Krishna is mentioned also in the Chandogya Upanishad. Devaki Putra. Krishna is mentioned by Panini. Krishna Arjuna Bhyam. And Krishna is mentioned in the Gita. However, the very example you used, Dramshadji, is it disputed by scholars. The Krishna mentioned in the, Krishna means dark, dark. The Krishna mentioned in the Veda, we are not sure that it is Devaki Putra, the Krishna about which we are talking. So that's why I did not mention it. And we, only when you can establish on a scholarly basis that it is the same Krishna will I agree with you. That is all. <laughs> yes, please. Um, sorry. Okay, sorry, uh, I, I'll come to you. Uh, thank you for your very enlightening lecture. You mentioned that the majority of people in India are Hindus and it's well on its way to becoming a global superpower. In light of that, I'd like to ask, how do you think Hinduism in the world as an entity, a concept and a religion will change in the next few decades? Thank you. If I could give you a firm answer to that, I would be a very rich man. <laughs> But I can give some kind of personal opinion. And you are very right to ask this question because it's a crucial question. Because modernity is constantly with us. And globalization is with us. And the concept of globalization is quite new because what globalization does, it breaks down traditional barriers. 50 years ago, Jamshed Ji was, he says he's 20 years my age. If I, if in five years I can be as sharp as you, I will be a very lucky man. But 50 years ago, a local piece of news stayed local. Today, because of the porosity of boundaries, something happening in a small village in India becomes viral in a few seconds. That's what globalization means. The speed of information output and the impact of that. Now, India has to contend with that. And of course, notions of the religion are changing. And I mentioned that we have got a new force politically in India, which wishes to banish the polycentric tradition and make it monocentric. There is only one way, one text that's important, one way of understanding it, one way of applying what it is to be a Hindu, and others are excluded. If that tendency wins, the Hindutva tendency, politically, let's not mince words, if that tendency wins, then this polycentric, perspectival approach is in danger, with all the repercussions of that. If the traditional way continues, then in the next generation or whatever, there will be alternative forms of this polycentrism, but it will continue. Now, the political, ed uh, the electorate in India may not be educated in the Western sense of education. They can't write a dissertation or a thesis or uh, whatever, but they are very savvy. They are very sharp. And they still, in a democracy, call the shots. So my hope is that this enlightened, polycentric approach which is perspectival and allows for the viability of other points of view, creates a public space where different points of view can coexist. My hope is that that continues, because as long as that can continue, there is less chance of conflict and more chance of peace. One last question. 
Sorry, one last question because I think we have to to close. Yes, please. Pro. The gentleman there. Okay, then I, I'll have. I, prom I promise it will be short. Okay, okay. but uh, I'll let him ask first. I'll, I'll come to you. So, yeah. Thank you for a very enlightening speech, um, Professor. Uh, my question is, if um, in the Vedas and the Mahabharata and the Gita, you mentioned there was a military background and um, a militarism that was fundamental to the core uh, text, um, what happened in India that there were so many invasions that almost sailed in without too much opposition? And one view is that it's a very peaceable religion and that's why there wasn't any contesting. But the original view that you propounded was uh, there was a strong military and you have to fight for what you believe in and what is right. Can you comment on that, please? Well, I'll, I'll express my own view a little differently. I, I don't think I said that um, the st strong view that you have to fight for what you believe is right. That, of course, is true, but you can fight in different ways, not necessarily to warfare. And you talk about different invasions. Well, you must remember one thing. Till the British came, quite recently in the history of India, India had, did not have a political unity it was full of different rashtras or kingdoms, right? It is, a, it is, it is a called a subcontinent. So though they shared beliefs of worship and beliefs of dharma, if you look at the history texts, if you look at the religious texts, warfare among Hindus was very common. One king, Hindu king, conquered another Hindu king, don't wait for later on. One Hindu king conquered another Hindu king, took the religious image from the temple which was in the Garba Griha from the temple and placed it as the Dwarapala or the, to show his own superiority as, as, the, as a doorkeeper of his own temple as a proof of political authority and power. So fighting among kingdoms, I mean when the British came there were over 550 kingdoms rules in India, rulers in India. So, you cannot, that means that when there are invasions from outside, they are not fighting the whole of India. They are fighting individual kings who could or may not win or could lose. So, we need to have a concept of India according to the situation of the time. And that can explain why invasions took place. The more unified force, was, in terms of warfare, more successful. But if you look again at India, the south of the country was, uh, continued to be under Hindu rulership and so on. So, if we contextualize the situation, it becomes more understandable and intelligible. And that's what happens all around the world, and India was no exception. So that is my short answer to you. Thank you. If I understood right, uh, the, the uniqueness of Hinduism being identification with others and that being the found, uh, fundamental foundation for peace, is bhakti or devotion an essential component of Hinduism or even any religion for that matter or is it more an excuse to discipline or force that discipline? Well, you have used the word bhakti, which comes from bhaj bhajate in Sanskrit, which means really to participate. Love is a secondary meaning of that word. So bhakti is the abstract noun of bhaj bhajate, to participate in someone, to share intimately. We have, we have translated it by the word devotion, devotion. But there are different forms of devotion and many Hindus regard devotion in different ways. If you're an Advaitin, you say devotion is important only up to a certain stage of spiritual development, after which you realize your identity with the Supreme Being, whom can you be devoted to? Everything is one. Devotion requires two at least. So the word bhakti itself has, is a chameleon word. It has lots of different meanings and lots of different shapes. In this tradition, it means one thing. In that tradition, it can mean another. In this tradition, it is a dualistic concept. In the other tradition, it is 
eroded by mono, 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 monistic beliefs and so on. So I don't want to use bhakti as an integral part of the devotion of, Hindu, of the definition of Hinduism. It depends on the individual. What I'm saying is integral to an understanding of Hindu is the polycentric approach to the world in which bhakti may be accommodated or not, depending on the circumstances. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, I have to bring this question and answer session to an end. Thank you for your participation. And it, of course, remains to, for me to uh, ask all of you to join me to thank the professor for answering the question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rajan Krishnan and Professor Ripta. Thank you very much, Professor, for this very enlightening speech and Q&A session. Next, we would like to thank the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, and I call on Mr. Rajan Krishnan to present a token of appreciation to Ambassador Ong Keng Yong. Ambassador Ong, could you please come on stage? Thank you very much, Ambassador Ong, and thank you very much, Mr. Mohammad Arami, for this uh, wonderful uh, relationship that we have uh, forged between the Hindu Endowments Board and the S. Raj.